So everyone, we'll get started in like three minutes or so, based on technology catching up with our motivation to start. Also, thank you, Amber. I'm gonna shout you out. So you're going to start with DeAndre, right? Yeah, but so I'm going to mute the camera and the video. When, when you start talking, I'm going to mute the camera and the video. Okay, uh, if it's going to be live, I might as well just talk to TDH. It's on eight minutes. Okay, it's okay. up to you. You don't have to. Yeah, okay. okay. Excellent. Okay, then I'm going to turn it off. <laughs> All right, we're about to we're about to have sound. All right, welcome everybody. I want to say good afternoon, and uh, before we get started, I'm Shantree Martin. I will be moderating today, um, but I want to first recognize the land that we're on. As you all know, this should not be our land. This building should not even be here. Uh, we want to recognize the Native people who were here before us, recognize that we are on land that was stolen. Uh, do with that what you want, but I hope you do something about that. All right, so we're going to kick this off. I'm very excited to be on this panel with some people I admire very much, some more than others, but all of them, just to say. All right, so <laughs> thank you to our chair, Ignacio Evans, for putting this panel together. Can we get a hand for him? All right, so this historic panel, uh, we're going to start off with DeAndre Yergin. He is a pan african Studies junior at the University of Louisville, as well as a person on the Dean's List. Uh, he recently won the tournament at Utah. We also have Taylor Bro. Uh, she is a Lakota and Ojibwe scholar and expert, uh, has written extensively on our people, and I love her probably the most of everyone on the panel. Um, <laughs> we also have Ignacio Evans. He is a graduate student at Wake Forest. He is also an expert in rhetoric. Next, we have Bo Larson, a white trans scholar, someone who has written extensively and has much more work to come. We're very excited to have them on the panel. Next, we have uh, two panelists who will be presenting together. We have Charles Sugino. Am I saying it right? Athanasopoulos Sugino. Right. Yes, uh, who's a pro study journal author as well as uh, will be publishing very soon and presenting on Saturday on Black Panther. He's a Black Media Studies scholar. We also have Corinne Zugino. Uh, her forthcoming lateral journal article is sensational, and she is a radical Asian studies expert. All right, so we're going to kick it off first with Deontre. All right, is it good? Can, am I able to hear it? All right, hello everyone. So my name is DeAndre. In this paper, I'm going to be discussing a particular speech act and debate called topicality. For those who are not as familiar with the debate, I'm going to make sure that I kind of like talk through it and make sure there's a clear understanding of like how topicality functions. But basically, this paper sets out to examine the ways that policy debate as a speech community navigates the anxieties produced by the racial other. So I define a debate as a speech community and continue on with Dr. Shannon Brinkley and Dr. Uh, Tip, uh, with Dr. and Process, Tiffany Dillard Knox as the community sharing rules for the conduct and interpretation of speech and rules for the interpretation of at least one linguistic variety. Uh, and so basically the argument that this paper has is that this paper focuses on topicality as a speech act that functions as a performative or a word or phrase that inaugurates a change to the status quo through its utterance, which is in line with our Austin's articulation. Topicality as a performative serves as a technology of anti-blackness to reinstantiate a black-white Manichaean divide of the debate space. The illocutionary force of topicality serves as a primary stage and ground for the revigoration of the stereotype as fetish described by critical race theorist David Marriott, who functions as the substitution of difference by a reified standard, and although that seems like a lot, I'm going to unpack it. So before I get to that, in order to interrogate topicality as a performative, it's critical to highlight the analytical tool that creates the contours for this analysis. So the analytic outline by Spillers, or Horton Spillers, Dr. Horton Spillers, via the interior intersubjectivity, serves as a mechanism to read, in her words, the representational, where the subject commences its journey into the looking glass of the symbolic. And to forefront this, or to contextualize that, I use and employ psychoanalysis as a way to understand the debate space and interpret the speech acts of the debate space. 
So continuing on the idea of the interior intersubject intersubjective, Dr. Susan Driver uh, in Intersubjective Openings, Rethinking Feminist Psychoanalytics of Desire, Beyond Abnormative Ambivalence, uh, describes Spiller's projects as Spiller seeks to decipher the desire and narratives and images embedded within daily communicative struggles that broach boundaries between conscious and unconscious, social and personal, textual and corporate relations, and then continuing on in order to theorize specific temporality, space, and discourses of experience it becomes crucial to read and listen, respond to local narrations of desire. The practice of theorizing desire is not commenced in the psychoanalytical at all, but is firmly rooted in the habits and level of communication, reading, and interpretation. The reason why I think this is crucial because it continues on insights from both Fanon and Spillers about the limitations of traditional psychoanalytics to speak to black subjects. So continuing on the conversation of psychoanalysis as the kind of theoretical framework for this project, Returning to debate, debate as a speech community has some norms, such as argument notation via the flow, which take notes in a smaller, more compartmentalized fashion in order to line up response by an opponent to answer in the next speech, or for the judge to adjudicate to have a record of the debate round. So we have these really, like, really small columns of argumentation that's, like, jotted down uh, for debaters to respond to, but also for the judges to kind of notate. There's also certain jargon that's more formalized and more normal in the debate space, which creates the kind of boundary of the speech community. So continuing on, the basic speech community has some norms such as argumentation, notation, via the flow, and that is in line with Dr. Shinnery Brinkley's understanding of the particular norms that the debate community engages in. The reason why I find it important is because returning to the definition of speech community provided by Delheims, when Delheims articulated the process of sociolinguistics, it's important to recognize that the second portion of that definition explains the process of interpreting speech for bodies. And so, one of the norms that I want to talk about is the way in which black bodies who presence themselves in debates are responded to. So continuing on, Dr. Shinnery Brinkley describes the resolution as a statement that's given at the beginning of a speech year. And policy debate is usually in relation to a policy action that the government should do, whether it's positive, positive state action such as the creation of the law or negative state action such as the removal of the law or a replacement of the law. And what's important about this is Dr. Schnarri Brinkley contextualizes this understanding of the resolution as something that is static, something that is flat, something that is always to be interpreted literally. And this is kind of where we get to a conversation about predictability for debaters. And so using this understanding of the resolution as a space of predictability, um, I kind of go into a conversation around the racial performatives and how that relates via things like defense mechanisms. And continuing on there, what ends up happening or to clarify what topicality is when a team reads a non-traditional understanding or interpretation of, of the resolution, their response with, uh, they met with a response via topicality which argues that the given affirmative proposition does not meet the resolutional standards for what debate should be or what debate should look like. And the reason why I think this is important is because it exemplifies a response to black bodies inside the space of debate. So going on to a conversation of defense mechanisms, the primary uh, analytical tool that I use here is David Marriott Critical, Dr. David Marriott Critical, Bray Scholar, and this is a conversation around the stereotype as fetish, which is a continuation from Homi Baba. What does Fanon say of the stereotype in David, uh, Dr. Marriott words? He tells us that the imago of the black is the predestined depository of cultural aggression, but questions, we talk the questions why predestined, and in uh, racial fetishism, Fanon presents an interesting challenge. This racial fetishism can, as tends to be the case in Fanon, be a perverse relationship to difference of which the fetish acts as a defense against more intolerable forms of anxiety, while allowing subjects to enjoy this fear more or less secretly, more or less violently. This fetishism of representation would then be, as Vicky Lebeau has brilliantly shown from a different point of view, the place where fantasy becomes real. And the reason why into the conversation around a question of defense mechanisms is because Marriott contextualizes understanding of the response to black bodies in terms of the stereotype that is basically able to create a protective barrier in order to not be revealed to the differences of the other. And the reason why this is important is because it's in line with another reading of Black Skins White like Mess that I have um, from Fanon. It says, and this is the infamous moment from chapter five, dirty nigger or simply look a Negro, 
And after that, it says, I came into the world and be with the world to find meaning in things. My spirit filled with the desire to attain the source of the world. And then I found that I was an object in the midst of other objects. The reason why I go to that point in the book in relation to defense mechanisms is because the look at Negro in my estimations functions as a racial performative that is able to outline and diagnose or basically just demarcate where black bodies exist inside of the space. And in this instance, for non's existence is more of an intrusion look of black body look and intrusion, uh, an object that intrudes on the spaces that are pre-outlined for white bodies. The reason why this is important is because it also relates to the way in which the resolution functions this particularly pre-understood zone or space in which we're able to have debates over what the resolution means is more or less foreclosed by particular things like topicality, which basically says you have not met the standards, you have not met the uh, definitions of what this resolution should be, which is a defense of the spaces that black bodies of, which is the defense of the spaces that non-black bodies inhabit. The reason why this is important in summation is basically the idea of topicality functions to securitize and protect white space the same way that the look of Negro is able to demarcate where black bodies exist in and out of these spaces in order to shield against actual interactions with them. Time? Okay, time. And we'll just continue. Um, Hi, Okay, cool. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Taylor Brough. Um, like DeAndre and like many others on the panel, I'm interested in thinking about and kind of meditating on um, what are the norms and procedures and protocols through which what I've termed settler master debate basically conceptualizes and conceives its own mastery, particularly as regards black debate, but I'm also attempting to think native debate practice and protocols um, from within that purview as well. Um, you know, given that this NCA is themed as being about survival, I wanted to think about what are the legacy and traditions of survival that are rehearsed in order to constitute certain kinds of community. Um, so from within the purview of my work, I would argue that NCA, as well as intercollegiate policy debate, as well as um, the case study example that I'll give in a moment, which is the case of Harvard Indian College, um, all maintain their survival through the entheme. So for those who aren't familiar with rhetorical study, the entheme is basically an unsupplied premise that the audience fills in, um, but that isn't stated by the speaker. So the themes that are going to animate the work I'm about to share with you are about the enthemes of sovereignty and vitality that I argue affirm basically a community, an intrahuman community, um, or a community formed around what Frank Wilderson terms an intrahuman conflict. And intercollegiate policy debate, as well as the Harvard, uh, the Harvard Indian College, are sort of parallels insofar as the kinds of communities that they're able to constitute um, require the foreclosure of you know, what Wilderson is arguing and what I'm arguing are the grammars of accumulation and fungibility that authorize black enunciation and black life, and, or which is to say death, um, or the grammar of genocide, which is part of the grammar that authorizes native life. Um, so briefly, the Harvard Indian College was built in the 1600s. It was intended, it was the first brick building in the Harvard Yard, and it was intended to serve 20 or so native men. Um, so mostly people from the area around Harvard, which is Pequo, Wampanoag, Narragansett, etc. And so native men are recruited to this college by all of these white men in order to be civilized. So they would have to dress and wear Western clothes, they would have to learn to speak English, and then later would be required to speak in Latin and Greek, the, obviously, right, the languages of European diplomacy and aristocracy. Um, while at the same time, black people are barred from civilized enlightenment through being enslaved at the college. And so we see at Harvard Indian College, I argue, a process that really mimics what we see um, in debate. But in particular, my work, I'm interested in studying 
one of the students at the Indian College, whose name is Elazar, um, who was a Wampanoag student there, who wrote an elegy for D. Thomas Thatcher, who was a white man who was presumably his mentor. Um, an elegy, this is Thomas Thatcher has died, or D. Thomas Thatcher has died, right? So this is supposed to be a speech of praise. Elegies, as studied in rhetoric, are speeches that are attempting to produce and provide community, to provide a sense of what is to be done next, right, after this catastrophic event has occurred. And so Elazar's speech actually functions quite enthematically through the tropes of sovereignty and vitality. So he repeatedly says, you know, he constructs an idyllic homeland epitomized by heaven that he can share with this white man in the grammar of sovereignty, right, the nostalgia for an idyllic homeland that animates both native sovereign gestures, right, the desire for a pre-contact time, but that also animates um, white desires, or settler master in this case, desires uh, to self-indigenize, right? Desire to belong um, without, without complication. Um, but also in the grammar of vitality, so Elazar also repeatedly says, you know, that, that blessed life returns to life, right? So he's framing the soul as undying, the soul of this white man, which I think personally is quite disturbing. Um, but that also speaks to the ways that and these enthymemes function to secure life against death, which is also to say to secure the civilized or to secure civilization against the risk of being overwhelmed by the uncivilized forms that surround the Indian college in the form of black and native people here. Um, and debate is engaged in a number of different rhetorical practices that parallel this move and that suggest the endurance or the survival of modernity's preoccupation with vitality and with sovereignty, and also the ways that they require juxtapositions against death and unsovereignty. Um, and so the argument that I'm forwarding about the relationship to debate that all of this has is that native debate, while incredibly difficult to theorize about because there are a limited number of participants, which itself is a function of genocide, um, is for the most part speaking to the settler master and within the settler master registers of sovereignty and vitality that are enthymemes that authorize that those speech acts to produce certain kinds of community to the exclusion of black grammars of suffering and black debate generally, and also to the exclusion of part of the constitutive fabric of debate, which is genocide, right? You can't have a civilizing enlightenment mission without genocide. But part of the problem is that all of these non-black native people in debate are failing to account for genocide because they're failing to be authorized by the grammars of suffering of death and unsovereignty that begin from blackness and, you know, part of nativeness, the genocide that structures native existence. Um, and so this poses a number of different problems, obviously. First, that it means that Native people are sacrificing grammars of our own existence, but also that it means that Native debate can't, at, at the place where it stands right now, can't honor the traditions of Black debate, if they can even be called traditions, right? Um, but can't honor them or can't begin from, you know, indebtedness to Black debate because Native debate is so vested in its own interest in building basically a sovereign and vital community alongside the settler master and alongside settler master debate. And so, yeah, and so it should be clear that that's a problem, right? But it's also a problem because the, you know, and w Wilderson and others have pointed this out about debate for an incredibly long time, but because part of the problem with following the protocols of settler-master debate is that it requires basically that that legacy survive into the future as the only possible forum for argumentation, as the only possible forum for deliberation. And so part of what I'm wanting to think about is, you know, how might we in inhabit as non-black Native people the antagonism of genocide in order to think through, well, what are the generative things that are produced through the invitation to that antagonism? Right, things that don't, in fact, rely upon debate as a civilizing mission, but that can create and innovate other kinds of ground, other kinds of approaches to the rhetorical, you know, moves that people have been making in debate 
um, in order to resist the settler master protocols of debate for quite a long time. So my work is, hi everybody, um, my work, I, I guess that wasn't for me. Nope, that's the one. Alright, um, hello everybody, my work is entitled, Niggas Reliquidation and the Timeless Struggle of Niggas in an Anti-Black World. One of the things I want to start off with is a clean discussion about what do I think niggas are versus black people, because I think it's important and imperative before you hear the rest of my spiel about my things uh, because a lot of people get this confused. And so the first thing that I'll outline is that black people are a creation uh, that is fabricated by civil society. What I mean by this is, is that the notion of what you understand black people as are in the public are a collage slash terraforming of thoughts, ideas, and desires and then superimposed onto black flesh. I make a distinguish uh, I, I make a distinction between what is black flesh and black bodies, partly because black bodies, which still adhere, in, we're in a calm discussion, right? We're, we're still adhere to uh, Butler's point to be able to say that bodies appear in front of the law. My point here is that nigger flesh, if it appears, is only to be used in other ways. It is a means to an end. It is an extraction process. And so I'll clarify. Um, my work is largely considered, like, my, my work is largely concerned, or is considering the question of niggatry. Niggatry here in a plain and simple, cut and dry kind of, here it is, here it's not. Niggatry is, eh, don't feel like it. Niggatry is for niggas. Niggatry is nigga shit, nigga shit, more nigga shit. And so when I say that, I mean that niggatry is a discussion of nigga things and nigga life. It is a difference, or I'm trying to demarcate the difference in what people understand as black life. The kind of life that dies at 76 because one is angry that they have to live in an anti-black world. I'm talking about nigger life. The kind of life that wasn't expected to be born, but definitely ex exceeds its expiration date. I'm talking about the kind of life that moves between, I don't fucking feel like it, and come holla at me, or I want to smoke. I'm talking about the kind of life that exists between... I'll feed my kids today no matter what the fuck it takes. I'll rob Peter to pay Paul type thing. I'm talking about the kind of life that says that I will stay black and die. I don't need to be a citizen. I don't need to be perfect. I don't need to be tall. I don't need to be light-skinned. I don't need to be correct. I just need to be. Right? And in an academic study, this is a question of eminence. Right? And sitting with the questions of not only anti-black violence, but then what are the pro-black uh, struggles that make those things possible. And I don't mean by black, I mean, I don't mean by black when I say political, I mean black when I mean the flesh that we're speaking to, the decisions that one makes or don't make, right? A lot of times, and to put this in perspective, a lot of my work is trying to be relative to not only the flesh that have to experience what life is, but also the time in which they exist in. And so when we think about this, I'll quote Don L., uh, Lee here in, was it the book, Die, Nigger, Die? He says, you know, hmm, what was acting nigger two years ago is accepted as soul now, right? And so when we think about what does it mean to be in a space that always is moving, time is always circulating, it is always progressing, if you will. If that's true, then it has to be a discussion of what does it mean to exist as nigger? When I talk to generations before me as a black person, they use different language to describe themselves, whether it be cool, uh, whether it be I was foxy or whatever. But we know those as common derivatives or at least common extrapolations of black speak. Some of the current deliberations or like examples today is by Felicia, which is a very anti-black statement, especially had by non-black people or non-niggas. But then secondly, also you have yes, bitch, as an example of because people like to describe this as cultural appropriation. I think that's cheap, right? Uh, my work does the work to unravel and then revival or recomplicate the notions about commodification here to suggest that there's a next level uh, that pessimists are discussing, which is in the question of accumulation. I think accumulation here is not just a collection of things and say that I can remark and name those things, but here is the repurposing of the re-extrapolation, which is what I call nigger extraction. 
Donald, uh, it was like Ronald Judy has a great piece on nigga affect that discusses somehow how this preliminary work happens. My work takes it to the next level and, and explaining the nexus between wants, desires, and ability to appear in public as recognition. The reason why my, folk, my work ends and starts at the question of eminence is because we're trying to disavow notions of recognition to appear, right? A lot of my work criticizes how black people get to appear on top of niggas. The greatest example of this since we're in Baltimore is Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Woman who got on television, mayor at the time, and goes, yes, Baltimoreans are thugs, which terraformed every black walking body, no matter what you did for a living, no matter what you talk like, no matter how many degrees you have, as potential thug-like activity. And so for me, it's the discussion about what did she sell? She sold niggas. What did she sell niggas for? A gavel seat at the DNC the very next year. That's all she got. She didn't become governor like most mayors of Baltimore City do of Maryland. She didn't get another seat. She didn't get to run for another mayor, but nothing. That's all she got. So she sold niggas for cheap. When we think about this concept, a lot of people think that just because that description was phobic, it is one or it's the only way to describe anti-black violence. My work does a lot of the work to also throw, for example, uh, people like um, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, for example, and her relationship to hot sauce in her bag as another extraction of niggas to be able to then use that as a form of purchase, right? She got something from that as well, even though she didn't get the presidency, right? My point to you is that purchasing, buying, selling niggas, and the extraction process is something that is so common, so quotidian, that we do it without even question, right? Black people do it to folks, right? The only thing that we can do is turn in, as John Galanti says, turn into self, turn into nigger, right? My advice to non-black people, non-niggers, is not to turn into nigger, right? But instead, my paper has a caveat for you all to look at little reason, which is to turn away from reason with a big R with a K on it, right? Which you now understand is logic in a lot of ways, to turn away from that. Instead, to turn towards what Ralph Ellison names as a pattern of movement or patterns of Right, is to hyper focus on the performativity and the relationality that the performativity shares with not only power but other people. Hence, at the end of my presentation, I beg of you, all of you, who are niggas. My mom gave me this advice in this grade that she's sitting in the audience. I tell you all to stay black and die. Right, to give you another adage, to be a niggas nigga is a great goal to have and a great goal to sabotage. I know. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Will Larson. If you don't know it or we haven't met, I really want to thank Ignacio Evans for putting this panel together and Dr. Shanara Ray Brinkley and Chantrese Martin for being the editors of the Contemporary Argumentation and Debate Edition on the Legacy of the University of Louisville Back Home X debate team. The name of my upcoming publication is called Transformative Invitations. Blackness, transness, and the intergenerational crises of intercollegiate policy debate. And it's focused on the impact of black revolutionary thought on theorizations of transness. My piece is attempting to observe and respond to the phenomena of white and non-black transgender thought both in and out of the academy that remains at large performatively hesitant to engage and reconcile with the interventions that black study has offered and continues to offer regarding gender and sexual formation. This project requires that I situate white and non-black trans anxieties regarding black thought within the larger continuum of white and non-black anxieties regarding black resistance apparent within the academic debate climate that we are all uh, a part of and differently situated within. Writing about the University of Louisville's Malcolm and X debate team's legacy required me to dig deep and situate myself within the lineages I come from in debate. Anti-blackness is the atmosphere of the activity, and the pushback against black radicalism is demonstrative of such atmosphere. White and non-black people like to rationalize the exclusion and fear of black radical argumentation on the basis of research burdens, dogmatism, or the move away from stasis. Speaking as somebody who's had these anxieties, though what do we possibly say to black people talking about black liberation? My piece is attempting to accept the invitation and speak with black scholars without either a performative submission or rejection of black study. The moments which we are critiqued when we critique ourselves are the moments I'm attempting to invite that can transform and transfigure our attachments to violence. 
It was in debate that I first learned to confront my whiteness as it was brought into question, uh, brought into question repeatedly. It took a long time to realize that this wasn't a mechanism of halting debate, but an invitation to theorize the implications of my own racial experience, an invitation to delve into far more precise and intentional argumentation, and an invitation to organize against the disembodied, distance, distant, rational rhetorical form in which I had been taught to debate. There is no doubt in my mind and the field of black, queer, trans, and feminist study that anti-blackness is integral to gender formation, and yet white and non-black, queer, trans, and feminist scholarship, even those who pro proclaim attention to racialization, continue to sidestep questions of blackness and black people. I remember some of my first approaches I had when I began to delve into queer and feminist scholarship while debating black argumentation. I can talk about the sexual violence I experienced. You can talk about your experience with sexual and racial violence. la di da it was the pushback both from people on and off this panel that emerged from the legacy of Louisville, where I learned, frankly, that that was not going to cut it. During my first semester in college debate, I was in a process of transition. I changed my name, pronouns, gender presentation, and along this, I delved further into feminist, queer, and critical race scholarship and the deployment of alternative methods of argumentation and debate. I made arguments about gender formation, presenting critiques of recognition and visibility, and stemming from the le legacy of Louisville, offered alternative performances of resistance using poetry and music, for example, to guide my argumentation. Over time, my adherence to the word trans has become less about an inherent affiliation with an alleged opposite gender, and more about navigating the refusal of gender assignation itself, disaffiliating my aspirations towards gender propriety and domestic ideals of white gender categories. As I dove further into trans scholarship, it became harder to communicate the meaning I wished to evoke in the usage of the word trans. If trans altered assignation, then assignment cannot be contained to de-racialized definitions of gender, nor can it avoid questions of ontology, existence, and dispossession that black study posits. Contesting assignation necessitates examination of the genres of the human of which gender and sexual sexuality and position serves, and the networks of kinship that underlie aspiration and affiliation. Throughout my paper, I apply the works of scholars such as Cynthia Hartman, Patrice Douglas, Shea Gossett, Eva Hayward, C. Riley Snorton, Marquise Bay, Tiffany King, Zakia Jackson, and Roger Ferguson to critique the analytic of trans as an identity category and to confront the centrality of whiteness, within normative, whiteness and anti-blackness within normative transgender politics. For example, Shea Gossett and Eva Hayward place the development of trans within the colonial sex gender system that has always worked to manage, conceal, reinforce, and displace race and racism. Trans comes into existence as a marker for gender deviance within a global schematic that entangles gender propriety, assignation, and with the black, non-black, color line, color line. Trans is not an inherently an ethical position that necessarily produces progressive or radical outcomes, but citing Gossett and Hayward here, because it is installed as a crisis associated with sex and gender, it also indexes how established categories of sex and gender have always worked to stabilize technologies of colonial racism, end quote. For Marquis Bay, transness is not a descriptor of a pre-given body subsequently determined by corporal representation in an identification proclamation, but rather denotes a disruptive, eruptive orientation that operates together with blackness as an original, para-ontological, poetic forces that name the nothingness upon which gender and racialized distinctions rest. Black, queer, trans, and feminist study alters the terms and conditions by which we discuss gender and sexual variance. I place varying theories together in my paper not to resolve the differentiations they pose, but rather to illustrate the expansive possibilities of productive contestation and debate and elsewhere that can occur when we place transness and blackness in conversation. I want to speak of trans debate and myself as a transgender debater with unease over its definition to crack open the orientations and directional aspirations and activity rather than identity or accomplishment, an ongoing refusal to come to terms of order, in this case, the terms of anti-black gender formation. In this way, my paper responds to the NCA prompt of survival. Following the definition and etymological roots of survival as living beyond, I want to forward my non-interest in the beyond. Blackness and transness should not move beyond, and are not about moving beyond anti-blackness and gender formation. Rather, given the paralogical distinction of Moten and Bay made following the home channel of Chandler, blackness and transness name the poetic force of, of nothing that precedes distinction. The anti-black framings of minoritarian survival presume queer, trans, and black as equivalent positions of non-existence, and that is a project I'm not interested in. 
Rather, white and non-black people and our access to the human and existence should theorize gender and sexual violence by centralizing questions of anti-blackness and our corresponding positionalities and their implicated function on gender and sexual formation. Survival and its attempt to move beyond might disavow the power of what is prior, of what proceeds. These are the questions that white and non-black trans thought should sit with and study. Um, a paper that we are co-authoring, thank you, sorry, um, called Clash of the Uncivilized, an Alternative Approach to Policy Debate. And so like a lot of other panelists, our primary concern is with this battle over stasis and conversation that's ha uh, being ha had in debate over the question of stasis. And so um, Roger Stoltz wrote in 2004 that the split in debate between critical and policy approaches has get gone beyond culture war to a full-blown class of civilizations, end quote. Um, that implies critical debate and black debate presents not a simplistic stylistic disagreement, right, but an antagonistic challenge to the foundations of the activity itself. And so um, other uh, people in the 2004 edition of uh, Contemporary Argumentation and Debate also expressed concern over a quote-unquote loss of civility in the activity. Um, however, as Amber Kelsey, who is in the audience today, highlights, the rhetorical move to rally the community around the shared stasis point functions to enforce liberal sovereignty's constant state of emergency against the wretched of the earth. And indeed, critical debaters, in particular black and minority critical debaters, are often framed as uncivilized, undisciplined, and a threat to the integrity of the activity. Um, and so taking the concern that critical debate presents a threat to the ability to produce adequate clash into consideration, we explore the potential for alternative approaches to policy debate uh, that have heretofore been discounted. Put another way, this article seeks to articulate the nuanced debates and clash offered by the uncivilized. Building on scholars such as Amber Kelsey, Shanari Brinkley, Tiffany Dillard Knox, Rashad Evans, and others, we argue that these debates, what we refer to as revolutionary v. revolutionary debates, or rev v. rev debates for short, uh, produce nuance and generate a clash over the nature of resistance to structures of domination. Uh, we choose to use the term revolutionary in contrast to traditional approaches to reform in order to designate these approaches that seek to move beyond mere reformulation of particular institutions to a reorientation of societal foundations. We seek to displace the presumption that debates ought to solely entail consideration over reform and the desirability of government action, and in doing so, uh, we highlight how centering black and minoritarian rhetorics produce thoughtful debates about the resolution concerning the analytical frameworks, methodologies, and representations deployed by opposing teams. Um, so at this point in the, in the paper, uh, we would have a section uh, titled Frame uh, Framework Makes the Game Work. Uh, stasis limits and clash. And so for the purposes of this presentation, I've sort of taken out a lot of the literature review of the debates occurring in this field, sort of emphasizing uh, with a few examples what I think is going on. So debaters and coaches who subscribe to the particular ideology of traditional policy debate have made it a point to establish an archive of stylistic practices and norms which protect the integrity of the activity by providing it a lens from which to interpret the resolution of question posed at the beginning of the year. So, for those who aren't familiar, there's a process of topic selection. People write topic papers, it is, uh, people vote on it, and there's, there's a topic committee. And they take that core controversy and they produce a specific wording that we call the resolution. So from the topic area, we get a resolution. Um, and so our argument is simply that the way that the topic committee archives these central controversies constrains the controversy into fields such as international relations, political, and legal theory which ignores other real-world literature bases that discuss these controversies in different ways. So whereas healthcare is a broad subject sparking debate in a multitude of disciplines, including theories of blackness, feminism, anti-capitalism, and social movements, to name a few, the wording ensures in a resolution that there's a limit on what we can discuss in relation to that topic. So the 2018 uh, resolution was that the United States should establish national health insurance, whereas the topic controversy was about health care. And so... The question then becomes, what happens when a debater gets up and argues for a non-state solution about health care and not health insurance? 
Well, according to the traditional proponents of policy debate, uh, then the, the benefits that debate is supposed to give us cease because there's a lack of limits on the discussion, which means that, the, that we can't predict what is going to occur, and sort of the end of debate comes about, of, of rational, logical debate. Um, but as Amber Kelsey has argued, this is a rhetorical ploy um, very similar to um, the far right, in which they believe that they are being replaced by this new form of argumentation. So you might think of Charlottesville, ironically, in a community that believes itself to be so liberal and progressive. And so we have this idea of the clash of civilizations from salt and parcher. And teams like Louisville are paved, have paved the way despite these critiques. And so we might situate this in context of the black rhetorical tradition. So authors such as um, Gilliard and, um, and Banks have made arguments that uh, white rhetorical focuses on this idea of uh, you know, capital R reason or logic, rationality, um, but it ignores uh, different black rhetorical traditions such as rhythm, call and response, signifying. Um, and so this leads perfectly into Dr. Shannari Brinkley's dissertation, which particularly studies uh, the, the Louisville team in order to argue that they are employing black rhetorical traditions such as signifying and genre violation. And so uh, we contend that, just as uh, Dr. Tiffany Dillard Knox contends, that policy debate must confront critical performance debate on its own terms. And this might be read in conjunction with uh, Christina Sharp's call to become more undisciplined, to find new ways of researching and thinking. And so the last thing I want to touch upon here is this idea of framing critical and performance debate as conviction-based as opposed to being interested in the best arguments. And this is an argument made by canonical uh, scholars such as Star Muir, but also more recent uh, debaters such as Casey Harrigan. And there's an important debate between an, uh, a black rhetorical scholar um, and former lawyer Rashad Evans with Casey Harrigan on this idea of black suicide debate, which is that we can imagine a different style of switching sides that centers black studies, black feminism, native studies, etc., instead of uh, political science and, and legal theory. And so we're sort of questioning what can exist within what has been called pathological and uncivilized. What exists under this narrative of the ghetto kids gone good? Um, and so the last thing I'd say is that this sort of might relate to Fred Moten's notion of the undercommons, of existing within a space that is for the domination um, and, and uh, an accumulation of our performances, but still finding these informal networks under that. And so the sort of last or the um, look major section in the paper looks at uh, putting debate about this debate about debate into conversation with existing scholarship in the communication discipline. And so we start by talking about Nakiyama and Krejcik, right, who write that whiteness exists as the unspoken center of communication discourse. And similarly, we argue that white policy debate presents itself as the objective center of the topic, um, although that is a uh, social construction. and. You know, drawing from Sylvia Winter's notion of the over-representation of men as human to signal how white people stand in as the metaphysical reference point for what it means to be human, we draw on her work to argue and discuss the over-representation of white policy debate as debate itself. Um, and you know, we sort of draw on some of the social movement scholarship from Lisa Flores and Michael McGee um, in order to think through what grounding there is in the communication discipline itself to say that there are alternative forms of clash that exist outside of the strict disciplinary boundaries that are placed on the resolution. Um, so before we get into the question and answer section, um, in the local tradition, we're going to have a performance. Um, I want the panel to also be able to prepare for the questions. Y'all did next, and I'm proud of y'all. All right, uh, raise your hand if you've never seen a Louisville team debate. If you've never seen a Louisville team debate. Okay. Anybody else? Everybody. So when's the last time you saw a Louisville debate happen? Anyone? Uh, All right, I know he was excellent. Uh, in the back. When's the last time you saw a Louisville debate? For me, it was probably Houston. Wow. 2004, a decade ago. Who did you all watch? A debate. Oh. Oh, okay. Did you win? Uh, no. <laughs> I, didn't tell you. I, just to know. I was curious because we were debating around that time. Uh, so most of y'all know this, but I debated for the University of Louisville. Um, I'm from the projects at Shepherd Square, and I didn't think I was going to get a scholarship, and I uh, cussed out some um, So we're going to have a performance. 
My niggas made it through slavery and broken commitments. Witness some witless, sinister bitches getting neglected, diminished niggas. Hitting me, tripping, getting bill collection notices. Hoping my check will stretch past gas and electric. I'm rolling with a flow. Crazy like it's ready to choose justification of genocidal extermination. My anger is latent. I want to know my father. So my heart is hurting, but I'll never give up. Even if my condition worsens, my mission is for certain. And now I fear no lies, so I'ma lay down my burdens by the riverside. Yo no soy uno usted quiere joder con cuando hablo, the roof get blown. My mother 200 years ago was hurt with a knife. Great grandfather Alonzo Wells got beat for his rights. And since he's been through all that and is still here breathing, I know my life has a purpose, a mission, a reason. The reason I do that is because, number one, uh, that's the type of thing that got people like me from hoods where nobody goes to college into college. And it's not just about debate. It's beyond. All the scholars y'all see up here are not just in debate because, like, they can't get a job anywhere else. Right. These are very employable people, as we mentioned earlier. Right. But it's because they see something that needs to be transformed. And these papers are the catalyst for that transformation. And I want to thank you all for all the work. As an editor, I know how many edits y'all went through. I know how much work you've done. And I saw the mediocre submissions <laughs> that uh, attempted to posit themselves as experts, right? But you all didn't do that. You all put forth original research. You put forth these ideas that are going to change the game. And I'm very excited to be part of that process. And I know Dr. Reed Brinkley is excited as well. So we're about to get into questions. Oh. Uh, so before we do audience questions, which we will have time for, I'm going to ask the panelists a few questions. Whoever feels it in their spirit to answer, you can answer those questions, right? Uh, so the first thing is, what are some of the barriers you've seen in transitioning between being a debater or a debate coach into an academic or scholar? I'll take it to you. Um, or at least I'll give you the first get the mic. Um, one of the... Yeah, one of the things, uh, because I debated as a critical, performative, slash pessimist debater, one of the things I've seen at the end of my career was that people are less likely to take chances on me in terms of giving me scholarships. To go to graduate school, people are less likely to actually hire me because they thought that I was actually angry, will break everything in their room, and didn't understand none of the argumentation. They also dissuaded the idea that it was all performative. And so a lot of the relationships that I had was that I'm the angry black man that probably thought that I was supposed to be. And if it wasn't for me making meaningful relationships with folks during my time actually competing, talking to the critics who voted for and against me to talk about how to professionalize and perfect my argumentation, I wouldn't be allowed nowhere. People did want Baltimore folks outside of Baltimore. So like, as one of those folks, a lot of the work that I have done to get into the academic arena, to get into spaces, to coach championships, was a lot about the relationships that I share with other niggas. It wasn't about my relationships that I had with institutions. It wasn't my relationships that I had with white people. It literally was, all right, look, my mama told me before I leave the house, make sure your G is on. And so I go, <clears throat> it's on. And then I will also then take care of my folk. Taking care of my folk meant that I actually met them where they were and then try to change them. That's what people who helped me the most did for me. And that's what my scholarship is trying to endorse. To not leave or throw away the niggas that you don't like or to be a part of cancer culture for that matter. But instead to be able to pick it up and to be able to move forward because I literally get hired. My first job as a debate coach was because Amber Kelsey literally took a chance on me. And before that, the only way in which I would get hired is if I agreed to be a nigga killer. And so for me, some of the discussions or distinctions between how I committed to not only my academic work, but my work as a coach, my work as a furthering student, all predicated on me having a ethical as much as possible. Because my work includes otherwise. But at least, you know what I'm saying, have a standing in a relationship with folks that matter. And I try to forefront that. So I think that my answer to this is sort of mixed. There's things that debate has helped me with in the transition, and there's things that, that's held me back. So one of the first things I, I, I'd say is that you know, we get really caught up in our community, and we have these terms that we know, we have these literature bases that we know, and we, are, we go and try and talk to a professor about those things, and they're like, well, you know, you have to learn my stuff, right? Um, and so a lot of times we're, we learn to create a theoretical framework and then apply it to whatever object we see. Um, and a lot of a lot of my professors have been really hard on, on that style. Uh, they would they would rather me start with 
whatever example I'm analyzing, and then sort of, what is it, inductive or is it deductive? Inductive reasoning, sort of start from the object and then allow that to speak to me instead of trying to like kind of cookie cutter it all through a particular theory. So I think that that was a, a hard skill I had to learn leaving debate because as a debater, just reading Afro pessimism, it's like whatever your app was, it wasn't this, and that means it's wrong. You know, um, but at the same time, uh, the, the other thing that's that's rough is that I felt like there were networks in debate that, that helped support me all those years. And then when you go to graduate school, those don't necessarily exist anymore, at least in the same level, right? Because they're not there with you on the everyday. And so there's a lot of push, specifically writing about Afro-pessimism, for these people to say to you, like, water down your argumentation. Your argumentation is scary. We don't like it. Scholars laugh you out of the room. Um, you need to talk about these other black study scholars who disagree. Um, and so there's always a process of checking myself to make sure I'm speaking to the communication discipline without watering down my argumentation. Um, but I think the good thing that we get out of it is like time management. Like people don't realize that traders, like we, we're doing an entire travel schedule plus doing undergraduate work. And grad school allows you to focus in on the thing that you like to do more so than undergrad, and you have a lot more time, especially if you're not like traveling all the time as a graduate student coach. And so um, I think using your time management and research skills from debate while also learning to leave some of the things that may work in debate that don't work in grad school behind is a nice mix of, of things to think about for people trying to transition. And I'll sort of extend the question for specifically Taylor and Bo. How do you deal with that where you are, you have to make the decision, are you going to say that we shouldn't talk about black people, or are you going to say that I'm too scared? Like, when you come to that point, what are the things that you would suggest not black people do? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, regarding your first question, I think one of the biggest differences between the transition from debate and academia is just the intensity of fragility that's within academic spaces. Of course, there's a large amount of fragility within um, debate, and that in my piece is attempting to work through that fragility of uh, white and non-black people. But I think that at least at some point in debate, like people do experiences, experience like you know not winning debate, people yelling, you know, <laughs> or, you know. <laughs> Um, loud argumentation, mean argumentation, um, but in academia, you can just say deadpan something, and, and the professors will just, oh, you know, <laughs> whimper in their, you know, whimper in their feelings, particularly in regards to black liberation. And so, you know, I've been trying to balance that being the white person that's just defending black people repeatedly, and you know, in intervening in anti-blackness when it's constantly present in in academic spaces, it's just like you have to uptake that role. So yeah, I think it's just super important in every um, instantiation as we can to, to continually press back against anti uh, What I would say to um, non-black scholars who are anxious about talking about anti-blackness is that that actually likely derives from asking the wrong sets of questions. I think it actually likely derives from thinking that anti-blackness is something separate from how we constitute ourselves, that it's separate from how we envision the work that we do, that it's in some way separate or separable from the experiences that we have. Um, and I don't think that that's true, right? I think that you know, um, and I think Bo said this really well, actually, in their presentation, but that, right, just as we can't separate um, our gender performances from anti-blackness, you know, and the way that it operates in a, in a quotidian or mundane register, we also can't separate our non-black racial identities I hate the term identity, but whatever. We can't separate our non-blackness from, in fact, the, the things that we conceive of as positive or cultural attributes that we also inherit racially. Um, so when I'm thinking about, you know, native debate, it's such an even weird moniker to gloss native debate, right? Because there are so many 
um, black and native people who don't even register on the terms of native debate actually because they're overdetermined by blackness. And, and that, that actually is because non-black native people have been so historically invested in speaking in the register of sovereignty and vitality of trying to build community with settler master people in debate that the only way that we can think about what native debate is is as basically you know a native person debating right who's overdetermined once again as I said as as not black or you know they're talking about native issues right they're talking about giving back the land right they're talking about you know they said crazy horse in the speech they said Indian war right and these are obviously quite reductive frames of thinking about the contributions that native people could make to argumentation but they're the only register that debate can think about native people within and that's actually overdetermined by anti-blackness that's not just you know this is what and who native people are or can be who we are or can be is overdetermined by the degrees of proximity basically that we have to black debate or black people and so we'll go ahead and open it up to audience questions. I saw a hand over here. And if you could um, speak loud enough for everyone to hear you on the video. Um, well, first, congratulations to all on such great work. So I can't wait to read that. Uh, basically, how has your time in debate influenced your particular theories that you're developing on? And that can be like an everyone question or whatever. This is actually something I left out of the answer that I gave about the barriers after slavery, which is when I think about the transition from debate, my time outside of it, it helps me reflect on what was going on during my time there. Um, and so as one of the like poster children of the New York City Urban Debate League, um, and in some ways a poster child of Wake Forest University as a, as a debater, um, it, it actually helps me to learn that a lot of people in grad school are going to try and, and use your scholarship as a way to look more progressive and how this relates is the theory of accumul accumulation and fungibility that we've been discussing through Afro-pessimism is that, you know, there are, just the same way that an urban debate league will use your image or a college will use your image, professors will try to use your image even when they're seeming to want to get close to you because then they can say, like, look at this, you know, black advisee I had who's writing this radical theory. Um, and, and then as they get close to you, they sort of try to shift your work. And so when I think about Afro-pessimism and the argument that um, blackness is always seen as accumulable and fungible, and also that the only way you can register black experience and black argument is by adjusting it in, into a simpler frame, a frame that can register on the liberal university's codes, it, it helps me to view my own life experience in relationship to those theories. So debate helps you take these theories, see how it's operating in your life, see how it's operating in those debate rounds, and then how that might apply outside of the activity as well. I got three points. Um, and I will say them in what it is considered people call it. I got three points. Right? Um, I'll say them in what people consider dating speak. The first one is uh, peeping and footwork. I had a group of students when I first started teaching debate, fresh out of high school, that was one of the things that they said to me when I first came to practice, because they was like, hey, what's practice for? And I was like, we're going to learn the things. And they was like, no, we're keeping the footwork. Well, for me, keeping the footwork is a old tradition that me and my mom used to do when we, we used to people watch folks on a bus now. And so that's the, the thing that carries into my work. Not only is a, a framing intent for low reason inside the paper, but it also gives credence to the clash of civilizations debate that we were talking about, which leads me to my second point, which is, I come from a hood where folks be like, who side you want, right? And that's a common game that we actually play amongst each other to be able to figure out where the power is and what is the rhetorical relationships we share in that exchange. And so as a result, literally, it influences my work because I then recast what is considered class of civilizations debates because niggas are not civilized. So what does it mean to ask this who side you want? The third thing that I'll say that is influenced is my work is not possible without all the niggas that I've ever met, that I like whether I like you or not, whether you're my friend, whether you explain coon, what it don't matter, right? My relationship to niggas have definitely influenced the rounding out what what I even conceptualize as a nigga. I want to give a, a shout out to Piper because she did this when we were at uh, a Cedar Finals one year. She was like, you know what? What does a place for niggas look like in this world? And I said, 
Mm-hmm. My mother's house. And she thought it was funny, but then I thought about what does it mean to actually create a place for all niggas. And that has literally been the push for a lot of my work. The Afro-pessimism critique that is provided ends in gratuitous freedom in a lot of ways. And I've just been begging myself to figure out what does that look like, how does it feel, and can I get me and my niggas to go? Because it ain't no fun unless we all get on. <laughs> Do you want me to? No. Hey, Nadia. Hey, Nadia. I'm going to drop one more. I'm going to drop one more uh, answer on the question because I feel like it's something that, like, you know, we also talked about before, but just in general. So, like, AD really uh, made me want to talk, and he's like, you know, from Baltimore. You know, even like that small slippage that a lot of people won't catch up on, but like one of the things that I would say about my time in the Bay is that it has given me the desire to kind of look at the different perspectives that are available. And basically what I mean by that is like, there are so many different people in the world. There are so many different people in debate, and there are so many different people like even in this city. So like, if you all leave the building and look out to the left, like I caught that train to school every day. Like, this is like my, Rolling ground, it's my stopping ground. I met so many different people, but at the same time, it's like taking debate for at one of its like most very basic levels, like an activity of communication. Try not to lose sight of being able to communicate with different people. Like if I can talk to debaters and if I can talk to the people that I've grown up with, then it's a lot of people that I can hopefully talk to, and just be able to keep, you know, not only the theoretical contributions that I've gotten from the debate, but also like the skills of like being able to say like. Maybe these are not people I should be conversing with, these are people I should be conversing with, which is like a part of the whole network, or a part of the whole conversation about black networking, or just basically just like navigating the world. And that's, you know. Uh, I want to say one thing. Okay. Um, I just Sorry. I know the voice is terrible. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, that debate, in part, taught me how to recognize when something is a civilizing mission. Um, So when are you in the boarding school? And what do you do when you're in it? Um, And that has helped me make both the transition to scholarly work in the civilizing mission that is the university, and it's also just helped me. It's actually a life skill, um, I think, for Native and Black people to be able to recognize what is the thing trying to civilize you. And frankly, it's a life skill for many others, but few people um, see themselves as negatively affected by it. So the settler master, as I term in my work, doesn't tend to see themselves as negatively impacted by the civilizing mission, um, even though I would argue that they are. Um, But yeah, that's, that's my concern. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess what I wanted to say sort of resonates with a lot of what other people have been saying, but debate um, sort of helped me think about connections and like like, com- like putting things in conversation where that normally wouldn't be in conversation. So of course, right, it's it's weird to you know be reading like something from critical ethnic studies, right, and thinking about you know how does this what does this have to do with this political science based affirmative, right? Um, because those are disciplines that don't necessarily talk to each other. And I think that, that is important, especially going into a calm grad program in particular and thinking about, well, you know, maybe the discipline isn't really talking as much to, you know, whatever Afro-pessimism or racial capitalism or something, but how, you know, how debate can sort of has helped me think about, well, how do I, how do I force that conversation or how do I think about putting them in conversation even if there's sort of resistance there normally or, or maybe just it hasn't been occurring um, prior to that. And so that's, you know, something that I think is, is helpful um, about debate. Right. Next question. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you for this. I really enjoyed it. It's a, a lot for me as a um, and really younger kids debating. My 10 year old daughter is in fifth grade, but she's gone to a couple of middle school terms. So, what I'm excited about then is the way the activity has changed. Um, and so, I guess my question for you is how do I provide her a better activity? How do I better coach her and kids her age? They, of course, have societal baggage that you're talking about, even at the age of 10. But how do we better recast the experience for kids starting off with debate? Um, 
so that we can incorporate much of the literature and the, the argument that, that you're talking about. Uh, maybe force the coaches of your kids to read some of the literature that they've been refusing to read for the last 15 years. Um, honestly, because I think a lot of it has to do with like high schools and colleges whose coaches just, they, they say, we have a curriculum set, this is how we debate, this is our vision of debate, and every time you debate this other stuff, we have one argument that you are going to read every single time to skirt an actual debate with that team. And so part of it is just to say, Debate has always evolved, right? Uh, there used to be no politics this ad, there used to be you know, hypo testing and stuff like that. Uh, this is an evolution debate, it's a good evolution debate, um, but particularly because of the argumentation that comes with it, people are unwilling to hear it. Um, and so there's a sort of just sort of putting pressure on this. Once, once you get to, to the conversation, that doesn't mean that your job is done, that doesn't mean that there can't be ways to engage in those conversations or sets of questions that you could ask that are the wrong sets of questions. But you'll never know until you actually start to read it. Yeah. Um, I'm really always interested in questions of youth. Um, one, because queer theory is interest in the question of the child, and two, because I think youthhood is so um, demonstrative of what it means to grow and what it means to learn and what it means to to be um, interpolated and trained into particular forms of violence. Um, so part of my piece actually reconciles with what do we teach. Um, debaters coming into debate, right? And we are all people that have taken the invitation of debate and run with it to push debate to its limits, to push debate past its limits or prior to its limitations. And so I think that I always just recommend that youth know that they have a power to transform the activities and institutional uh, institutions that they are within. Um, and it's up to all, all of these folks are on this panel are hiring. Every last one of them. So spend your dollars. Um, that good starting point. The second one is, and this is more to the first point, Wake Forest definitely has a debate camp that will offer services for students in the summer. Shout out to RKS. But we do work. So when you ask this question, it's like either you have not been coming to us, which I know because it's the first time I'm seeing your face, or you've been going to somebody else and you need to come to us. Um, this panel is a great example about why and how students start to get to dive into the things. Like, we're live streaming this. Most of my students are on the live stream right now. And like, yes, if you talk that shit, tell us what it means to be in those places. Tell us what it means to be valuable and how to value us. So, yes, hire us. I, 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 yes. So, and I'll say too, so I think I'm the only person who directed a league on this panel, but I could be wrong. One thing as a director, if I'm not directly coaching the kids, right, I'm dealing with the money. So I think one thing you can also do is have your child investigate the different systems and see what they care about first, because they're more likely to stay in the activity and activate other scholars, like young scholars, even though she's in, what you said, fifth grade? Yeah, that's the perfect time. My son is six, and he's already starting to debate. Um, I would say those early investigations to look at, like, what do I care about first instead of what is the resolution will keep her in the activity and help her to keep the people around her in the activity. Because, you know, I take it she is brown, right? The thing about being brown in debate is you will get discouraged at every step. Even I'm 34, and there are even points where I have white colleagues who tell me, well, I feel like that's a little too aggressive, or that's this, or that's that, right? And it's not just white colleagues. It's colleagues of all colors, right? So she's going, into, she's going to be in a precarious position, and if she starts from what she cares about, her intrinsic motivation, she is more likely to stay, more likely to be, uh, an advocate for other girls, boys, or other who feel like they're being pushed out. Um, so if you can keep that with her to know that, yes, you may be in a position of doubt, you may be in a round, and someone says, you're not allowed to talk about that, this is not the space for it. If she has the confidence to be like, maybe I don't have evidence, maybe I don't know all the terms, but I know that this is right. That's a really important thing. And I've, at this point, probably taught thousands of children. Um, and maybe some of them are on there. Some of them are Iggy's kids, too. We're step parents. <laughs> um, you know, it, that's really important. That's really important beyond her learning the actual stock issues and all that. Um, again, hiring people who already know that stuff, but also making her, letting her know that she can be one of the hireable people. A lot of us have dealt with imposter syndrome and like, well, I didn't win all the big things. Or even if you won all the big things, some people here have won a bunch of stuff. 
but still feel like, oh, I don't know, somebody better than me might know how to do it, or I shouldn't ask for that much money, or I shouldn't also ask for health benefits. That's, that might be too much. They might get scared. I don't want to do that, right? So having that confidence in her and letting her know that it is a privilege for the other people to be able to debate her. That is a privilege. She is giving them the gift of her presence. So, yes. Thank you. No problem. All right, do we have another question from the audience? Yes. Awesome. I can't wait to read the scholarship. Tell me about your thoughts on your relationship of that scholarship to the debate community. Mm. Is this something you're hoping circulates at the level of evidence read in debates? Is it something mm. different? Is it educational for coaches? What would you call it? <coughs> what you envision would be the ideal relationship of the scholarship to the debate Um. I absolutely think that every single participant in college debate, and ideally most in high school, should read this journal. Um, as to whether or not they will, I can't speak to that. But you know, the sheer uh, the sheer number of coaches who are on the side and routinely position themselves on the side of settler master debate, who refuse and have continued to refuse to read publications and published works by black debate coaches, um, some of whom have been in the activity for longer than the white coaches who are refusing to read the work. Like, everybody should be reading. Everyone should read the work. And particularly those who, you know, are scared to read it because they're scared that they'll be implicated in it should read the work. So the majority of my work is, is not centered around um, debate, and I think that's true for uh, for any of us. Um, and so for the stuff that I'm I'm writing that's not explicitly about debate, like the sort of my ideas, my contribution to uh, certain fields, and and I'm trying to speak to a larger audience, of course, beyond just those academics. But I guess you know if they want to read that stuff, sure. You know, if they'd like to ask questions, if they want access to those articles, you know, happy to provide them. I think this particular piece that uh, Craig and I wrote and all of these pieces are, are speaking to the, the current state of debate, and that's why it's particularly important for this special issue to be read by students because let's really think about the 2000, was it four or five edition of contemporary organization debate that uh, really spawned an entire generation of framework debating based off of this phrase of class of civilizations. You know, so if Dr. Loudon of Wake Forest can edit an issue and he can inspire that entire generation to go a particular way, well, I think that this special issue can do that as well. Um, and Dr. Scary Brickley has been doing this for years. The dissertation was amazing. Uh, all of her pieces have been amazing. People like you know, Daryl Birch, Iggy, Rashad Evans, Amber, these people have been doing this work, uh, both in print and the actual lived ex like connection to those students. Um, and so I, I think there's particular debate interventions, and then there is the scholarship of these individuals beyond debate that, of course, implicates debate just because debate is a microcosm of the rest of the world. I just want to give a, a caveat to my work. Um, Partly because my work uses what is obscene, what is seen as obscene language. Non-black people don't say nigga to me. On oh, God, don't don't say nigga. No variations, no derivatives. Like I'm not with it. And at best, you can discuss my work under the erasure of black eminence. Other than that, don't talk to me about the things it's not for you. The audience that I initially wrote my paper towards is for niggas. If you black people, cool, it's for you too. Um, for Native folks, there's a couple sections out uh, for you all. For other non-black people, there are parts of the paper you should read. But when we get to nigger and niggertry, don't ever part your lips. You don't get a nigger pass over here at all. But with that being said, I think it's definitely work that folks should think with to discuss how that me. I take seminars. I got my own personal business for sure. Okay. Um, so one vision that uh, Dr. Reed Brinkley and I have is that it also helps young scholars to understand the process of being published, understand the process of professional development. Um, it's, it makes me really sad. Like, it breaks my heart to be in boardrooms with no one who looks like me, 
Um, there are often no other women. There are often no other people of color. There's definitely not any Muslims that I've seen, no Native people. And I've been asked like for my like Native ID when I've even brought it up, yes, by one of the funders of an organization for Black and Native children, right? Um, <laughs> wild out here in these streets, um, in the streets of academia. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so part of our vision is to not only have an opportunity for these people who haven't been recognized nearly as much as they should for the scholarship they've produced. Even DeAndre, who's still in school, through his debates, through his competition, has produced scholarship and inspired people to write. There are people who come to debate tournaments who are not necessarily participating, but who do research, and they include us in their papers but don't necessarily give us credit. We don't get the leverage that they get from writing the paper, right? So part of what we want to do is the professional development piece and making sure that all the scholars are getting work based on this, but also that they understand the process. This journal so far has been about a year and a half in the making. We may have another year to go, right? That's how academia works. But the average person who's never published doesn't understand the process. So we want to open the gates of access because once their papers come out and they're published, the opportunities will just blossom, right? So what we want to do is make sure any professional in the debate activity, whether you're a director, assistant director, recognizes that there is there is a lot that we have to offer, and specifically them because they are more entrenched in the debate community. And so again, like Iggy said, hire us, right? Publish us, cut our cards, do these sorts of things because you will proliferate the information. Uh, it shouldn't be the best kept secret. Like everyone should know Taylor's name. Like, if you think of Native studies in debate, if you think of Indigenous people in debate, you should think of Taylor, right? Uh, I don't think there's any other person in the debate community who's written and researched as much as Taylor, right? I know I keep saying her name because she's one of my favorite people, but it's it's not just about who I like, because y'all know I don't like that many people. <laughs> it's really about propping up the people who are doing this. Tuck and Yang are awesome. Love it, right? Um, uh, but they're not in the debate community. They're not, co they're not coaching debaters. So cutting our cards of places where they want people of color, they want people to talk about debate because they're fascinated by it. Um, so our hope is that we provide professional development for those involved. We have another author in the audience. Um, but also that we get those opportunities beyond debate. Right now, there are, I want to say, seven black di uh, directors in college, of either director of forensic or director of debate. The titles are different, right? Um, Y'all know how many people are in NDT? Like how many schools are in NDT? Whole lot. <laughs> about 56 who paid their dues last year for NDT, right? And you have about five or six black directors. That is unacceptable, right? And when you look at the diversity at the schools, it's much different. You would think some of these schools are all white based on the debate team and who gets to compete. But you step on their campuses like Berkeley, super diverse, right? I love Ben Carlson, I do. Uh, but the team itself is not only like racially white in many ways, but like the argumentation, right? So it's not to dig on Berkeley, that's just the only one I can think of right now because I worked at their camp this summer. But what we need to do is take it beyond like, wow, they're really smart and they said good things and they had big words and take it to, you need to hire them. Not just you yourself, but right, our colleagues need to also hire these folks. Um, I think I might be hired a couple. Let me make sure. Let me check myself. Okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> right. So using those budgets to proliferate their scholarship, that's really what our mission is. Um, so people know that, like, you're looking in the wrong places for these scholars, right? You need to look in new places, and these are the new places. So thank you. We only have time to wrap this up. Uh, with a comment from, he's gonna be a little upset, but a comment from our chair here. So if you could just give us closing remarks, Mr. Evans, we would greatly appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, this panel was a dream in the making. Uh, and I think that throughout all the conversation that we've had today, we can see that there's not only different access points to very similar conversations, but the nuance the nuances that are shared between the different conversations that we have had, have had on this panel today are important to not only discuss, but exfoliate, right? A lot of the times that we just leave it there, right? Um, and I think that our goal here, whether it be streaming, videotaping, or just even having it in front of an audience, is to make it go beyond our smaller circles where we actually have these conversations all the time. 
but instead putting it into other hands that are not just ours, right? And I think that this panel did a great job of reflecting not only the, like I said, the differences, but the similarities, actually. Because a lot of the times when we have these discussions, we're fighting to use the same language. And as you've seen on the panel, after each one of us were like presenting, there was a little bit of language picked up here, a little bit of language picked up here. And we all, for the most part, with, with the exception of three of us, go to different schools. And so it's important for us to then think about how can we not only affect our campuses, everybody who's watching, how you're going to affect your campuses, and thinking about not getting it perfect. Right? But instead, committing to the work and recommitting when it gets a little bit difficult and you don't know what it means, diving back in and not giving up when it's so, it could be so easy, right? Because it could be an opportunity that you can seize. And so I think that this panel did a great job of seizing a different opportunity, trying not to twig in the face of anti-blackness, but provide substantive conversation and substantive tools Right, that extend beyond conversation, that extend beyond how we feel about the thing so we can commit to not only more work, but better work, more efficient work. So I don't be exhausted, so we don't be exhausted. <laughs> right, I want to be you know, 40 and be cool. Shout out to early bedtime for old people. Thank you. It was fun. I'm going to read the comments. Um, the panel, say hi to the folks. Hi to the folks. Hi to the folks. Hi to the folks. Instagram coming. Hi to the folks. Hi to the folks. Hi to the folks. I'm not in this, but I'm just saying hi. Hi to the folks. 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 Hi